ดีค่ะ Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Italian Design Day in Thailand and Myanmar 2020, the first ever event that we're hosting it virtual through the online channel. I'm Shanita Sidakit Krethorn, your Master of Ceremonies for today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the collaboration between the Italian embassies in Thailand and Myanmar and the Italian Trade Agency in Bangkok, which focuses on promoting Italian designs to other countries. This also includes creative ideas which will be le leading to inspiring and sustainable design developments. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our audiences who are attending from four countries, from Thailand to Myanmar to Cambodia and to Laos, who have joined us in our this Zoom session. So a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you very much. Now, for our registered users, Although English is used primarily throughout the Zoom session, we have also prepared interpretation, so simultaneous translation for all of you, um, which will be in Burmese and Thai for your convenience. If you have any questions at all, please use our Q&A box to drop any questions for all of us, and then we'll be picking some of the questions um, which will be answered by our um, guest speakers today towards the end of the session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me um, have the honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. Leonardo Cavalli, the president of Milan Architect Foundation. He will be giving his speech on our today's concept, which is drawing the future development, innovation, sustainability, and beauty. And furthermore, it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's excellent panelist. The first panelist joining us today is the Associated Professor Panit Pujinda, who is the president of the City Planners Association, or TCPA, and he is also the head of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Faculty of Architecture from Jualungon University. The second panelist, she's the adjunct professor Marie-Louise Hu from the International Programme Design and Architect or INDA at the Faculty of Architecture from, Univers from Jualungon University. Our third panelist, she is the senior manager for the capital projects and infrastructure of PWC in Myanmar. Her name is Ms. Tessa G. Morton. The fourth um, panelist, He's an urban development and urban transport consultant. His, um, his name is Mr. Uwin Tenlin. And our last panelist is um, the Chief Research and Product Design Officer of the Planet Smart City, um, is Ms. Graciela Rochella. And ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my great pleasure to give a special thanks to our four um, simultaneous interpreters today. The first one um, interpreting for the Thai language is the assistant Professor Dr. Antika Sawatsi, who is the Dean for, of the Faculty of Architecture from KMITL, and Mr. Wutisan or Woody Narumitian for, um, and thank you very much for your um, help, for lending your helping hand to translate from English to Thai. And also we've got two other interpreters doing a very difficult job today. Um, the first one for the Burmese language is um, Miss Zin Lerwin, as well as Mr. Lazum Timothy Brangsing. So thank you very, very much for lending your helping hand um, to help our, um, our audience um, to understand it much better in their lo local language. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is now the perfect time to proceed to the opening speeches. We've received the honor from our two ambassadors who have joined us to deliver the opening speeches. And the first speech is from the ambassador of Italy to Thailand. Please give a warm welcome to His Excellency, Mr. Lorenzo Galanti. Thank you very much to our Master of Ceremony, dear Ambassador Schiavo, dear Mr. Lamacchia, Italian Trade Commissioner in Bangkok, architect Leonardo Cavalli, dear panelists, and ladies and gentlemen following us on the web. Good afternoon from Bangkok. I am pleased to celebrate the Italian Design Day 2020 with this inspiring initiative. 
So many thanks to the Italian Trade Agency here in Bangkok and to our partners, OneWorks PPS, Chulalongkorn University in the program, the Association of Siamese Architects, Planet Smart City, PwC. We are particularly proud to present today's initiative in Thailand and Myanmar, as well as Cambodia and Laos, in cooperation with the Embassy of Italy in Yangon. The Italian Design Day is a global event promoted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy with the Ministry of Cultural Heritage and Tourism, the Italian Association of Industrial Design, the Association of Industrialists, Confindustria, the Milan Triennale and the Salone del Mobile. The Salone del Mobile is the most acclaimed global design event uh, for furniture, actually the global benchmark event for the furnishing industry, and it takes place annually in Milan. Now, Italy and Thailand have a long history of collaboration in architecture and urban design, as the work of many architects from Italy, such as Mario Tamagno and Annibale Rigotti, in the first half of the 20th century sh still show to this day in Bangkok and throughout the country. Our aim to this event through this event is to promote and support more collaborations in this very sector, also in the framework of the concept of smart city, so relevant in the ASEAN discourse. We will do this with architect Leonardo Cavalli from OneWorks and our other panelists, having in mind sustainability as an all-encompassing dimension, also when using digital tools and big data for urban planning 2.0. Allow me to thank again the Italian Trade Agency and OneWorks for making this event possible, all the staff here in the studio. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for participating and happy Italian Design Day. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Mr. Lorenzo Galanti, for your opening speech. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome yet another very important guest of honor today. Please give a warm welcome to Her Excellency, Ms. Alessandra Siavo, the Ambassador of Italy to Myanmar, for her opening speech. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much also for this um, introduction. Uh, dear Ambassador Galanti, dear architect Cavalli, Director Lamacchia, dear authorities and professors and panelists, students and friends who are joining us from Italy, Thailand, and Myanmar. I'm very happy that so many prominent figures from the Peter Duttaf, the Ministry of Construction, and the Yangon Municipality, from the Myanmar Architects Council, and the Engineering Society, from the Departments of Architecture of the Universities of Technology of both Yangon and Mandare as well as representatives from civil, local, uh, or civil uh, society organization are joining us today. It is with the greatest pleasure that I concur to open this webinar and a real honor to address you all. The topics we are debating today are of paramount importance for the whole world. Since by 2050, then more than two thirds of the world's population will be living in urban areas. This trend will take place predominantly in developing countries in Asia and Africa. Urbanization has the potential to improve the well-being of societies, despite the fact that nowadays around half the world's people live in cities that generate more than 80% of the GDP, offering to residents more job opportunities and better incomes, and to businesses lower input costs and greater innovation chances. Having a population relatively younger compared to rural areas, cities also become key places to capture economic dividends. Yet, rapid organization also implies numerous human development challenges. It is assumed that nearly 40% of the global urban expansion may be in slums, exacerbating unsanitary conditions and economic disparities, increasing pressures on public transports and roads congesting on energy supply and basic services, raising environmental concerns and vulnerability to natural disasters, especially for cities located in coastal areas or on riverbanks like Yangon. So to be positive, urbanization has to be carefully planned, even more so if it is a rapid phenomenon. And I believe that there is hardly any city in Asia, if not in the whole world, which has changed so dramatically in the last seven, eight years as Yangon. 
after the country has begun to open up to the rest of the world and given start to its crucial democratic transition. At the same time, having remained essentially isolated for half a century, Yangon still presents a skyline and a cultural heritage which is in considerable part intact and which makes it one of the most unique cities of its size anywhere. The other fellow speakers from the Myanmar side, U Winter Lin and Mrs. Tessa Martin, whom I wish to thank for their precious contributions, will concentrate on the links between sustainability, development, and urbanization, providing you with many data and in-depth information. I will focus on another issue that I think is crucial for the quality of the future of Yangon, and that lies at the core of the intimate relationship between beauty, cultural heritage, and urban sustainability. This is actually one of the themes of our webinar and one of the fields where Italy can offer support, long-standing expertise, and quality know-how. The story center of Yangon reflects the uniquely rich and cosmopolitan past of this wonderful city, with many beautiful ancient and pre-colonial buildings, such as pagoda of incredible majesty, churches and mosques, Hindu temples, set lining around grand mansions and administrative or financial structures from the colonial period. It has been calculated that unfortunately over 1,000 pre-World War II buildings have already been demolished in Yangon. As a consequence, it is now imperative to protect what remains still a huge heritage but is now at risk of being replaced by contemporary buildings after a long denied desire for modernization and globalization. As Utan Min Tu, the most famous Myanmar historian uh, wrote, has stated, Yangon is at a tipping point. The wrong development over the coming years could doom it to the same fate as so many other cities in this region, stripped of its links to the past, with better infrastructure, but without any character, a place no one care, would care to visit or feel any special attachment. Or it can really be an amazing place that has all the good characteristics of today and be as modern and convenient and lovable as many other cities in Asia. Italy fully appreciates the richness of Myanmar culture and is aware that Yangon and Mandalay have been important hubs and cultural centers. We are convinced that they have the, all the merits and potential to resume, hopefully as soon as possible, their role as crossroads of civil additions and vibrant platforms for the exchange of trade and ideas. Being home to the greatest number of UNESCO World Heritage sites, Italy is not only aware of the importance of cultural heritage, but also of how fragile it is. One of Italy's deepest wishes for Myanmar, in addition, of course, to democracy, peace, economic progress, and stability, is that this beautiful country manages to preserve its cultural and architectural heritage and transmit it, possibly enriched, to successfully to future generations. To contribute to this endeavor, the most important critical site was for us Italians to help the Yangon region to expand the database of all existing heritage assets in Yangon so that these data could be utilized as a basis for various planning initiatives and for the preservation of historic buildings and urban landscape. Under the so-called My Touch One program, which has been successfully completed last year, the Italian Agency for Aid Development Cooperation devoted almost 800,000 euros to provide technical assistance to the Yangon region government through the support of the Yangon Heritage Trust. Thanks to this, thanks to this funding, the Yangon Heritage Trust has prepared a study of the current legal framework to evaluate its strengths and weaknesses as a tool to protect the heritage. Perhaps even more importantly, it has drawn up a full and consistent inventory of the 2,000 heritage assets existing in downtown Yangon. 
Italy is now available to launch a new program, which will be called My Touch 2, and for which we would be ready to allocate even more generous financial resources between 10 and 15 million euros to support the restoration of one or more historical buildings in Yangon and for the requalification of a nearby block. The necessary negotiations with local and central authorities are still ongoing, but we would, it would be our aspiration not only to assist, execute the restoration, but also to present suggestions for you, new destination of use of these buildings, possibly cultural related. We would like to do so involving, once again, local civil society organizations, if possible, also local universities, and promoting effective public-private partnerships. In our vision, the project would also have an important social component in favor of the most vulnerable groups, with some pilot activities aimed at including unskilled labor in the rehabilitation works and at improving, for example, the working and hygiene conditions on nearby street vendors. Our national experience has taught us that preserving cultural heritage in urban areas is also a powerful driver for economic growth and for social cohesion. It can attract more tourists, it can build better jobs, and also stimulate more environment compatible choices. Last but not least, promoting cultural heritage preservation in Myanmar also means protecting identity and uniqueness of Yangon as a rich tapestry of religious, religions, and cultures thus also serving the cause of peaceful coexistence among its many ethnicity, ethnicities and components. To conclude, Italy is aware that Myanmar will have to struggle with mounting pressures also on the front of urban planning, amplified by the fast pace of change and also by the many and diverse and urgent priorities this country already has to face. Because of this, we intend to stand by Myanmar to help it promote its economy and capitalize on it, the potential of its beautiful historical site and cities. Heritage conservation can be a critical tool in fostering economic progress and strengthening the social fabric of a city by confirming and by feeding the traditional bonds between the people and the places where they live and work. Cultural and architectural preservation in a simple word the protection of beauty are part of the talents and know-how that Italy has developed throughout its national history. This is why we now wish to share it with our Myanmar and of course also our Thai friends. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Ms. Alessandra Schiavo, for your opening speech. Ladies and gentlemen, we have prepared a video presentation, a very short video presentation um, about the Italian Design Day titled, There is a World Behind Everything. Please enjoy.
and that was the video presentation about Italian Design Day titled There's, There's a World Behind Everything. Ladies and gentlemen, before we proceed to the next item on the agenda, I'd like to draw your attention that throughout the talks, you can drop any questions um, at the Q&A function just at the bottom of your Zoom program. Um, we also have um, prepared, um, even though English is primarily used um, on this um, Zoom session on the virtual um, session. You can also um, select the translation, which um, the feature is called interpretation. You can choose either Thai or Burmese um, up to your preference. So you can understand all the materials in the local language if you prefer. Now let's move on to the next item on the agenda. And um, earlier today, there was such an honor to have the two ambassadors here with us giving the opening speeches today. And I believe that it's a perfect time to begin the talks. Now, our first speaker is speaking live from Milan. Please give a warm welcome to the president of Milan Architects Foundation, Mr. Leonardo Cavalli. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for this invitation. It's actually a great honor for me to be the representative architect for the Italian Design Day 2020 in Thailand and Myanmar. And of course, I shall thank the two ambassadors, Lorenzo Galante and Alessandra Schiavo, the Italian Trade Agency and the IDD, the Italian Design Day organization, as well as all the speakers and all the audience which is uh, attending to this, uh, to this meeting. I have prepared a presentation. I will now try and share it from Milan uh, to the rest of the world, uh, let me uh, let me know whether you see it. Uh, can you see the presentation? I guess so. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. <clears throat> so um, uh, the uh, the main topic, the Italian Design Day 2020 is trying to discuss is really development, innovation, sustainability, and beauty. Uh, those are very important words within uh, our work. And I will try uh, through a series of slides to uh, so discuss the matter. I think discussing architecture and urban planning uh, in in a moment where technology is changing in a very, on a very fast pace, it's a, a very relevant topic for us as architects. And uh, I believe the role of time is something uh, that we have to carefully think about. Um, I'm showing our Milan office not to show uh, our practice, uh, but the reason is because this is a building built in the 50s uh, in Milan. It was actually built as a <coughs> car repair shop for Fiat, uh, at the, cam the Italian car manufacturer, and then became a space used by the fashion business, and now is an architecture practice. So as you see, uh, as, say, technology, people's behaviors, aspirations, and the user space change at a very fast pace, the urban fabric is actually due to survive across many generations. And so it needs to be resilient, but it's also something that has to uh, be a center of our thought to understand how designing things which will sort of stay for a very long period, decades if not centuries, uh, then we have to uh, think how these things can accommodate different behaviors across time. When we were asked to design the new square at City Life, and I will come and describe this project later on, but I just want to focus on something which is to me very relevant when designing public spaces. Of course, there was a perfect brief to design a square, a square to be dedicated to uh, the people coming for shopping. But then one day, eventually, uh, let me, I guess you see also our faces. Uh, let me see whether I can change this. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can do this. 
disable. All right. Okay. I think that's better. Um, then, as we built the new square, um, something very uh, different happens, and uh, uh, a different crowd, skaters, cyclists, came to the place, and those were in a way unexpected. This is a private developed square, uh, but it is, of course, a public square, so the developer uh, called us and, and asked whether we could do something to stop this. But eventually, we all understood that the very value of a public space is to be accessible to everyone, to become a proper common ground to the larger communities and not just serving the, the specific reason for which it was actually built. <clears throat> and this takes us to um, a more complex relationship between technology and the city. I'm showing two pictures, which one is a picture of the 1920s, is actually a Cubusier building with a car, and then is Florence uh, a few months ago. And just to show the complex relationship that technology and the built environment built uh, and how it changes, it's funny how. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Singapore at in NUS. NUS is the National University of Singapore. And I was talking to some uh, very advanced researchers looking into smart cities and technologies applied apply to cities. And they took me through a research where they were looking at uh, applications, technological applications, uh, to optimize and control driverless, driverless cars uh, to be hired in a city, so something for the very future. At the end, it was all very interesting. At the end, I asked one single question to the head of the research and asked, listen, how do you see then the city, the future? And it was clearly something um, the researchers never asked to themselves. And eventually they answered, well, probably the same as today. So this, in a way, shows you the complex relationship between how you actually design a city which has to um, live for many centuries and the technology which has a much faster uh, place. And we had a, a practical um, experience in Milan, but not just in Milan, during these extraordinary times of the pandemic, uh, uh, how to deal with the public space and without really uh, having any money or having any time to change uh, the opportunities that public space would give uh, to all citizens. And we eventually found that just replacing uh, a car park, uh, street parking, with nice terraces for bars and restaurants changed the perspective of the city without really changing the actual hard fabric of it. So in a way, and I guess one of the speakers following me will uh, try and discuss this also within the South Southeast Asian environments. And it's interesting how Southeast Asia is now experiencing a stable economic growth. This happened to Europe after the Second World War. And the discussion between uh, innovation and conservation was always there. I'm showing here um, two uh, researches done in the 60s. Uh, one is Plug in City, very famous. A technological and futuristic approach to the growing um, the growing uh, population, the, to, to the answer to the growing population uh, in Europe in the 60s, and a totally different approach uh, Italy took. And I refer this also to what uh, Ambassador Schiavo was referring to, the heritage of uh, ancient cultures and the history of countries. And in Bologna in the 1960s, a new approach to um, historical styles was taken. It was actually very successful, and it became, and it is still, one of the main drivers now in Italy on how to deal with historical towns as you, at the same time, develop um, uh, new towns or new extensions of towns. Um, it's, in a way, taking us to uh, what uh, I wanted to discuss with you today, uh, the relationship between um, technology, innovation, beauty. In a way, all these words 
who are always there within the discussion on, on architecture and urban planning. I think uh, the very new word now we have to look at is actually sustainability. Uh, sustainability is something which is urgent today for the whole world and is adding on top of the other three words which we used uh, to introduce the 2020 design day but it's actually i think something we have to look at very carefully and it's actually share responsibilities and there is a complex responsibility we all have and including the architects there's been long long discussions on how to manage energy how to manage uh, the operation of buildings and i think great um, uh, so we reach great advantages on this side but it's now i think time to look at the actual fabric at the materials with which we build uh, uh, our world and our environment and i wanted to start with a project we developed for the airport in Venice where they needed to grow capacity for the airport. So the two options in the beginning, shall we build a new terminal or shall we leverage on what we have? And I think it was a great choice to actually leverage on the existing building, which you see in this picture, through two different moves. One, building a new extension to the land side and then building the extension to the air side but actually leveraging on the existing fabric on the existing material and i'm showing this because this is, this is of course a planning decision but it goes down into the actual design this is uh or this was uh, the old terminal and what we did to extend it was actually to adopt a technique which we call infill adding a space between the existing buildings, in a way preserving uh, the uh, character of the old building and adding on. And in a way, you know, th there's a big issue with uh, uh, the existing buildings and the existing materials. The embodied carbons uh, within um, uh, in, in the construction phase is a much higher consumption than the actual operation of the building in the next 30 years. Uh, uh, so I think this is one uh, thing we should look at very carefully and has um, other relevant uh, outputs which I will try and discuss with you today. This is a section showing how within the existing building we just put a new arcade, a new glass arcade on two floors, which is actually maximizing the existing while providing the terminal with a new space much needed uh, for the operation of the building but this is not just about uh, looking at big infrastructures when we look at the existing buildings and this is a very relevant matter in europe now and in italy U italy and europe uh, are a built environment and uh, looking at how to transform and build the contemporary city is strongly related to the understanding of what we have and the value of the existing fabrics. This is a project now on, uh, on site. Uh, we are looking at this 60s building, uh, which you see in the, very, in the very center of Milan. And what we did was actually to preserve the actual um, fabric of the building and working on the facade just to make it more efficient and to adapt it to the contemporary uses of an office building of course and this happened to the back as well when an 80s building was transformed into something uh, totally different but in a way preserving say the 60 percent of the actual material the building was built of so in a way uh, preserving and making a very sustainable, having a very sustainable approach to the building, of course, introducing new technologies and uh, working on the relationship with the, uh, with, the, with the city, but really leveraging on the existing fabric. And this has not just to do with, uh, um, say, environmental sustainability. I think it has to do with social sustainability as well. Um, buildings urban spaces urban fabric 
are a shared memory. They survive us our, our lives. Uh, they stay for decades, the centuries, and they build our identity and our places where communities identify with. So when we approached one of the most beautiful modern buildings, if this is a building built in the 40s in Milan, built by an architect called Alancha, uh, we really thought about how do we approach something like this, something which is now part of the memory and is part of our daily uh, background, daily life background. So uh, we thought that actually preserving the value of the building and just adopting a very uh, subtle strategy, uh, changing um, uh, the building very little, introducing items like the big canopy at the top and adding a new floor uh, had to do with actually preserving the whole idea of the value of this great modern building of the 40s. <clears throat> but this, of course, we went through uh, three projects which talking mainly about uh, the actual fabric of buildings, but uh, an, a sustainable approach applies to uh, urban planning as well. Uh, we won a competition uh, to design uh, the new public spaces for a bit, one of the two big developments happening in Milan in the last couple of uh, decades. I'm talking about city life and I'm talking about the design of the park and mainly the square. The square which I referred to in the very beginning of the, uh, of the presentation. This used to be the fairground of Milan. So in a way, uh, uh, the idea was to leverage on the existing infrastructure, which were there already and were used for, for decades uh, to display uh, all the fair exhibitions. It was actually the place where the Salone del Mobile was, was mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, took place for many years and now has moved into the new fairground. So the building of the new fairground uh, made this very big plot available to be redesigned and actually integrated into the city fabric because the fairground was actually present, was, uh, was inaccessible uh, for most of, uh, uh, most of the community. And is, I believe, possibly the first TOD built in Italy Together with the development, it was developed a new metro line and uh, the actual uh, station for the, called now Tre Torri is uh, the very reason for uh, redeveloping this new site. So this introduces, I believe, something that one of the panelists will try and discuss with you later on, the relationship between um, transportation and development, which is again something we should look at not just in terms of accessibility, but also in terms of sustainability. Great mass rapid uh, mass uh, transfer systems are a great tool to leverage upon when we, when we think of a new development. <clears throat> of course, there's different ways to look at it. This is just one picture of, a, a, I believe, a Chinese city. Uh, where where a big infrastructure, a big transport infrastructure has been uh, displayed across uh, an urban area. And this is the approach we took uh, for City Life. So how do you reconcile the, relation, the, the very complex relationship between transport infrastructures and the quality and the value of public spaces? <clears throat> this is, I believe, our social responsibility, responsibility for architects, of course, but uh, for the whole community. Uh, building uh, public spaces accessible to everyone. Of course, those spaces need to respond to the brief. Uh, this is a main shopping destination, a main office destination. It's actually a very, now a very successful square um, connected to the uh, metro system, as I shown before, so it actually works and and very relevant, maybe again uh, and maybe a possible parallel with the south uh, South Asian experience. This was privately developed, although it's clearly a public space and as a space carrying all you need um, to actually make it a great destination also for the developer but is the place which is open to the unexpected. 
And I believe this to really be the key when looking at public spaces. And uh, it'd be interesting to listen to the following panelists uh, uh, on the way the public spaces perceived in Asia. Uh, so be open to all sorts of communities and really trying to think of the public space as the real common ground for communities the, play, the place where we identify with is actually our challenge. So, and balancing these long-term values with uh, the changing needs which happen every day, to technology uh, changes every day, uh, uh, we understand that. But uh, balancing these two elements, so looking at how time works with the infrastructure and the actual fabric and with the changing behaviors, is really our main challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cavalli, for your insightful and very thought-provoking talk. Um, I believe that we've learned a lot about how a perfect blend between the traditional uh, tradition and modern designs can come about. And yes, as uh, Mr. Cavalli has mentioned, we have a big queue a big line of uh, um, panelists to discuss their views on this matter now let's start with the first panelist um, they will be discussing the concept under the concept drawing the future development innovation sustainability and beauty let's begin with our first um, panelist who is the president of Thai City Planners Association or TCPA and he's also the head of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning Faculty of Architecture from Jualongon University. He will be discussing his view under the discussion of the titled um, Public Art for Sustainable Urban Spaces. Please give a warm welcome to Associate Professor, Professor Pinit Pudinda. Um, good afternoon from Thailand um, and from the Association of Siamese Architects. It is my great honor to be invited as the panelist to the Italian Design Day 2020 and I will share my experience in the topic of public arts for sustainable urban space. Um, I will bring my slide up quickly. Okay, um, public space in Asia, including for Thailand, share the common problems. Uh, most of the land in the city are private owned, and there are very few government owned land that can be used as the urban space. With this kind of situation, they are resolved in two dimensions. The first one is all the public space are the same. The public space that can be publicly used have to follow the very strict general standard of government regulations. Uh, it cannot be adjusted to fit the context of each area or each city. Uh, it results in lower quality and worse looking and overall less attractive. The second point is the government owned property is uh, strictly used for government use only. Uh, even during the outside normal working hour for the government, the space still do not allow people to use it due to the security and management reasons. Um, by these two limitations, uh, Bangkok green public space per population is below general standard at just uh, 6.79 square meter per person, uh, comparing to the 9.0 square meter per person by the WHO center, as well as uh, Bangkok is ranked at fourth most traffic congestion city of the world because we have just only 11.4% of road space comparing to the overall area of the cities when the standard of being for city require the road space ratio around 20 to 30 percent. And for Thailand, uh, the design trends to solving these two limitations that I uh, that 
I already told you is uh, Thai architects and urban planner is trying uh, to answer the reason how to utilize this very small amount of public space to their full potential alongside the idea of creating beauty and attractiveness to match the urban context. Uh, I will give you some example uh, what the people or what the Thai architects and urban planners try to solve this kind of problem. The first one is the art of crossing at uh, Siam Square. Um, you may know that uh, Siam Square is the, the first or the very first of high fashion shopping zone area in Thailand and with many small building blocks and many small alleys. Uh, there are a lot of shopping walks and many pedestrians along the road traffic. The problem is cars usually do not stop for pedestrians at the designated crossing point. So we provide the more colorful and more noticeable crosswalk to motivate the pedestrians to cross at the designated point and make it more noticeable for the car drivers. We invite the architect who decide the Thai traditional giant statue on the Thai Air Asia aircraft to decide three crosswalk, which received a lot of good feedback and has turned it into one of the Siam Square photo point. And the second example is the art of crossing at the Thammasat University main cafeteria, which is the most used crosswalk in the campus connecting the main cafeteria and the student dormitories. Uh, so we let the student do the conceptual design and have the architect to adjust how to fit to the road safety regulations. With some limitation at the T junction, uh, we use 8-bit cartoon design concept uh, to fit with the limitation of uh, road painting technique and select it as the representative of the student crossing. Another one is the courtyard in front of the Thammasat University dormitory. At first, it was uh, only a plain courtyard and no one used it. Only a very few passerby. Um, with the assumption that if there were some painted line to guide the people how to use this area, uh, for example, we use the zigzag line, dot, line, and plane for a hopping game painted on empty space and letting people use their creativities to enjoy the space and creating value for the unused space. Another project is the city lab of the Serum Road. Uh, you may know that Serum is the main banking business of Thailand. The financial headquarters are located along both sides. And special character of the Serum Road is there are several buildings decide to have the space in front of their building connect directly to the footpath with our fence, resulting in the continuity of the public space connecting from private space on the walking path to the, uh, the area in front of the building. However, the connectivity was poor. People just want to move away quickly from the footpath and from the space in front of the building. So we come up with the concept of city lab by putting some activities on the footpath space in front of the several buildings and let the people try it for one month. Then collecting all the feedback as the crucial information for actual design implementation. Nowadays, the BMA or Bangkok Metropolitan Administration buy it and they coordinate many well-known architects that uh, was uh, assigned to design the space in front of each tall building and adapt it to fit with the footpath design by the architects of the BMA. And we hope that uh, the Serum Road will be the area that the showcase of the works of Thai architect will be shown there and the business area of the Thailand will be good quality in the urban scenery in the near future. This is the picture of the, uh, for the city lab project that we, we try to put it just only for one month and let the people try 
on this experimental project and we collect the data and give it to the BMA to to be the information for uh, for a designing uh, for the real project in the near future. Uh, and we let the people choose what the color of the serum lot should be. And we also decide the active bus stop. Uh, the area for the people that can jump or can be play or run on the area that not on the walkway. Um, the crossword and the chairs that put on the footpath that let the people use uh, the footpath in the other way. And the, the chairs and the piano and the crossword that put on the public space. And widen and more and more colorful uh, crossing and let the people can cross it e easier than we uh, used to have. And the last project that we try is the improvement of uh, Saraburi city public space. Uh, the city of uh, Saraburi used to be the livable city since it was the junction connecting Bangkok to the northern and the northeastern region of the country. It was the rest stop point in the past, but with the convenience of modern day transportation, there is no longer need to stop at Saraburi. Since then, Saraburi lost their popularity and liveliness. Therefore, the government has implemented as well as the concept of urban space and the city lab concept. By utilizing the unused government space when not used by the state agency, changing the parking lot of government agency to the public activity square. Um, and for example, the informal education school, temple and chai after the operation hour let the people use the space in the form of public space with painted ply dot and plane on the floor indicating how to use it. And there is also a walkway designed to connect this park together with the hope that having urban space or public space will convince the people to come and spend their recreation time after work and make the city more lively and drive economic growth. In the conclusion, with the new uh, public space design concept, of the public art or urban art in Thailand, we are trying to solve the obstruction and limitation of having public space by using more effective time allocation and to change the unused space to be more usable and let the people uh, bring them out of their house to enjoy the new approach of public space in Thailand. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, I can uh, give you some answer if you have. Thank you very, very much, Associate Professor Pranit Pujinda, for your very insightful talk. I especially love the fact that the, there's city labs and using design to adopt um, many uh, footpaths in Bangkok to become the um, space, public spaces, as well as Saraburi public spaces as well. Um, I wonder if there's any similarity or similar projects that has been done in the Western environment. So I I think maybe perhaps Mr. Cavalli would like to address um, yes. some lights on that. Thank you very much. Yes, I found it very interesting because what I saw is what we call tactical urbanism, which has been uh, something uh, we experienced in the past possibly five, ten years. And uh, uh, during my presentation, I, I showed one of the possible applications which happened during the pandemic with the change of use of what used to be street parking into the small pockets of public space. So it's a very similar experience and um, uh, the pandemic was just the opportunity, the practical opportunity to put something in place. But there's been a discussion for the last 10 years as interesting that this is happening in Thailand as well. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mr. Cavalli. Um, just to shed some highlights on the fact that any of the attendees, if you, wherever you're watching us, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom. In the middle, just really um, drop any questions at all to all of our speakers, and then we might be selecting your questions to be um, answered by our speakers towards the end of the session today. And if you've just joined us, um, if you'd like to listen to the um, this session in your local language. We also have very experienced interpreter who will be doing the simultaneous interpretation for you, both in Thai and in Burmese. So you can use that function by using the interpretation function on the bottom of the Zoom application as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to the next talk titled Architecture of Public Space Reflections on Inda Student Work. Our speaker, um, she is an adjunct professor from the International Program Design and Architecture or Inda Factory, uh, Faculty of Architecture from Jualongon University. Please give a warm welcome to um, adjunct professor Marie Louise Howe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and I am very excited. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you all see the screen? I assume so. Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Good. So welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Marie-Louise. And I'm a visiting professor at INDA, International Program in Design and Architecture, at the Faculty of Architecture at Chulalongkorn University. And originally, I'm from Germany. Uh, but for the past year, I've been living and working in Bangkok. So I would like to share some uh, reflections on public space and maybe show some examples of INDA student work. So let's start with uh, a map of Rome the so-called Nolly map that somehow exemplifies the idea of a European classical understanding of public space. And what we see here is basically large and small outdoor plazas. Uh, we can imagine cobblestones, fountains, monuments, uh, all these public spaces and their connective streets are shown in white. And uh, the rest of the city fabric, the housing is shown in black. But what we also see is that we already start to um, notice some interiors, mainly church interiors, that link to these public spaces. Here, for example, is the Piazza Navona. So in contrast to this, Bangkok, uh, an aerial view of the Siam BTS station, and uh, this is the Siam BTS station, and its adjacent shopping malls. And uh, once we reveal the interior, we can observe something like an inversion uh, in comparison to the map that we just saw of the public space in Rome, a change of proportion of what is inside and what is outside. So in a way, we could say that public space starts to invade the interior, creating a, a kind of seamlessly expanding network of interior spaces that merge consumption and leisure. So here we can see the CMBTS station and then uh, Siam Paragon up to the MBK in the south. In this example, the interior is flipped towards the street, revealing this kind of living room uh, type space that opens towards uh, the pavement. It's a, it's a kind of unconventional space that makes the relationship between the inside and the outside, between the private and the public, somewhat ambiguous. Often improvised, you could say that public space, at least from my observation so far, really maximizes the potential. It's a kind of opportunistic phenomenon here. Public space also emerges in the shaded underzones of large infrastructures like highways, sky trains, or bridges. In the case of this uh, passageway that is inhabited by an old man, and you can see his hen uh, over here. Um, an alleyway, or let's say a space in front of a bank during the day becomes a food market in the evening. An alleyway during the day turns 
or might turn into a venue for a Chinese opera at night. Or here an example of a street market with something like a makeshift temporary shading, providing shelter from the intense heat during the day. Or even a parking lot that turns into a dance floor at night. And I, I guess these examples suggest or display a kind of willingness to think unconventionally about what it means to be public. And uh, with students of INDA, of the International Program in Design and Architecture, we have continued to explore this unconventionality by looking at new ways of defining public space and also the architecture that defines it. And this is the first project I would like to show. It's called the Bangkok Underground Boulevard, which looks at the space underneath the existing city. It literally imagines to excavate public space in between the existing foundations of the sky train or even skyscrapers surrounding buildings, defining something like a vast interior um, that can be inhabited collectively. The second project proposes special zones in the city reserved for public use. So in a way, whatever falls into these newly defined public zones would be specifically planned for public program. And once these uh, zones start to appear on the map, they would form a new kind of public use map, almost like an addition to the existing land use map that we have that define commercial or housing zones. Why not imagine a new kind of category that is specific for public use? And we already saw a project that was trying to engage the element of the earth, the ground, digging into the ground. And this project um, looks at water at, as, a, as a kind of surface of potential. So water here becomes a shared territory. This uh, project in a way continues the culture of inhabiting water in Thailand, but it starts and it starts from the individual cell, the individual floating house that you can see here, um, that then through the aggregation, through the arrangement of these individual cells, through a very simple kind of corner detail, forms larger congregations with public space in the middle. In the middle. So the, around these public spaces in the center, the community can grow and shrink based on this individual cell. Um, also, this project sits at the intersection between landscape, infrastructure, and architecture. And um, there are basically many large-scale infrastructural projects in the Thai countryside, like, for example, the Srinagarind Dam in Kanchanaburi province. And um, rather than surrendering to infrastructure as a kind of yeah, monofunctional engineering-based pursuit, this project reveals what role the architect could possibly play in making these projects more public. So instead of considering the, the dam wall that you see here as this kind of solid of stone and concrete, the dam starts to contain rooms within it, carved out rooms within it that could be inhabited by people for public functions, for example, museum-like spaces or educational spaces. And then finally, let's return to the small scale. This is a spherical object that was, uh, was designed by our office, Fini and Rauer Architects. And uh, it is located in a garden, but at the same time, as you can already see in the sketch, it starts to pop his head over onto the street um, as a kind of marker. It's a small scale interior space that can be rolled through this institutional garden. Uh, it can be used in many different ways as a public stage, as a place to retreat, to lie down, or even as a meeting room. Um, so as a contemplative space, it forms on a very small scale, a resilience to the city at large. At the same time, it attracts people, magnetizing those uh, uh, passing by the site. And this is where I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Adjunct Professor 
Hao for your insightful um, presentation. And I, I actually find it very inspiring to, to see that you work with so many students who, who came up with such beautiful and um, integrating so many concepts onto, into the design and using architecture. What do you think, Mr. Kavali? Well, I, I think again, um, uh, although it may seem a uh, totally different approach, but I do believe there's lots of things which are similar to uh, what I also tried to explain. I think uh, uh, Marie-Louise was actually talking about different communities using the space, the same space, maybe in different times of the day or uh, through uh, kind of uh, change, uh, small changes in the meaning of spaces. Uh, in a way, this is something I, I, I also try to explain about particularly the user city life and how the unexpected was eventually included into the picture to make it a real public space. So I found more common points than I thought before hearing to, uh, from her. Thank you very much. Now, let's move on to the next panelist. Um, he is the urban, urban Development and Urban Transport Consultant. Um, his talk is that under the topic Promoting Equitable Urbanization in Myanmar. However, he's actually um, doing the Zoom session live from Frankfurt, if I understand it correctly. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Wu Win Ten Lin. Hi. Good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon in Thailand and Myanmar. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, let me start by, uh, well, thank you, the Excellency and Distinguished and Participants. And it is my pleasure and it's honor to participate as a speaker uh, for Myanmar and on as, as my country. Um, for this webinar. Okay, due to the limitation of time, I will jump into the topic straight away. There, uh, there will be three topics that I want to cover, and it's quite dense, so I will quickly go through them. Hope you can catch up. Um, the first topic will be on the... Okay. It will be on the the opportunities that uh, Myanmar can bring from urbanization. So let me start by coding one code that I always uh, like to use, which is that no country has grown to a middle income without industrializing and urbanizing. So none has gone to high income without vibrant city. So the rush to the cities, development countries seem chaotic, but it is necessary. So my point to saying here is that no, number one is that we are in the Myanmar is in the early phase of urbanization and the city like Yangon and Mandalay do have grid pattern layout already. And within this uh, few years, the poverty rate has gone down, partly due to the urbanizing. So these are the opportunities that we could grab for Myanmar at the early stage. If we miss this one, it will be a very, very difficult. The reason I'm saying this is uh, once the city of Yangon now has about 5.1 million. So this will be changing soon. Once it hit the mega city state of 10 million, we will be very difficult to turn back or fix all the problems. So what I want to point out here is that we are in the early phase of urbanizing. So we are only at 30%. So of urbanization, so 70 is living in rural area. So our neighboring country, Thailand, Philippines are already at 50% of urbanizing. So they are already ahead, but then we are, we are, we, we, we will go there, it's inevitable. Our, our urbanization will be coming. So we need to fix and we need to catch this window to, uh, to fix all these uh, urbanization problem. But but there are opportunities that we could grab. The second point I'm trying to make is the, the grid pattern, the layout. So basically in the city uh, in 1950 and 1970s and 1990, Yangon settlement has uh, been moved uh, like a size and services model 
to out to the north and the east sides. So all these new settlements on those uh, days at 1995 has uh, some form of grid patterns layout. But these, uh, these infrastructure already has been degraded over the years. So we need to start fixing all these uh, drainage, water supply, sanitation, all these uh, need to be fixed for urban upgrading purposes. And, but this is the opportunity for urban upgrading. The second, uh, the number third uh, opportunity, what we have is the poverty reduction. So our poverty has rate from 2005 has dropped to, from 2005 to 2017, it has dropped by 50%. So all in 2005, we were having around uh, 11, uh, how, let me say, uh, it's about 11 million population, uh, poverty, and it has dropped, uh, from, sorry, from 2005, it was 18.7 million, and the, pro the poverty dropped to 11.8 million in 2017. So it is partly because of urbanizing the job opportunities that are available in the city, for example, Yangon has bringing manufacturing and service sectors to the for for the for the rural for migrations. But uh, so these are the challenges we have as a, uh, Yangon. But there is a possibility that we need to we need to fix because be, become we become a mega city. So this is the point that I want to address for the first part. The second part is sorry, I'm flipping. This, uh, let me show this photo. Uh, it's just, it's, uh, I just wanted to show that these are the, city, uh, the, the towns in the, the township in the east, which I'm saying the sites and services. So these are all has grid button. So basically the roads are there. The, the, it has not grown organically or disorganized growing. So it's grown properly, but we need to upgrade the drainage, water supply, sanitation. So there is opportunity for us to do urban upgrading for Myanmar, and and another point I want to make is that because uh, because of these these grip button layouts, we there's a possibility that we don't have to evade or ex uh, exploration costs or resettlement costs or social disruption costs that it will incur if we start uh, if it is not with the grip pattern layout uh, plant. And now let's go to another part is the housing shortage. Before I go to this housing shortage part, let me uh, show you how the housing supply looks like in Myanmar. So the income desire level is one to 10. So 10 is the, the highest income, which is now currently served by the private developers. And from desire six to nine is served by the government, the UHD, but the point I want to make here is that the, there is a missing part of decide one to decide five. So the low income people and very low income, there is no agencies or there's no private sectors or there is no one is really interested in building the building uh, housing units for these uh, income level people. So the urban poor people will be left out if we not being served properly or if we don't plan uh, anything in advance. So these are the opportunity that we need to take on for housing supply for these income desire levels. The second part I want to show is the current uh, the quality of housing. So basically in this is the quality of housing in Yangon. If you look at it, the rank one and two is a permanent structure, which is 24%. That is like uh, condominiums, apartments, or, or the houses. But the point I want to make here is the rank three and four and five. So the rank three is uh, is a semi permanent, so it's wooden or some kind of structure, but it need to fix all the time. The set uh, number four and five is all uh, built with the with the leaf or the with the mud or very simple structure, which we cannot uh, it, it it cannot withstand the uh, the if there's a natural disaster such as cyclone or, or any flooding so these need to be reconstructed so currently 75 percent is either it has to be repaired or it has to be reconstructed so this is the quality of housing so coming to 
uh, housing shortage with this quality and then the, the informal settlements. Uh, there is a requirement of about 1.3 million of housing units by 2030. Current supply is only around per year by government and private sectors is only 20,000. So there is a huge gap of uh, housing requirements for nearly 1.1 million. If we don't start fixing now, so there will be a huge, uh, huge, uh, requirements and then this will push further the informal settlements that there will be growing of informal settlements if we don't solve this problem now there will be more proposably large slums coming up to fix uh, uh to because there is no mechanism that is helping to sustain all these uh housing requirements so just example i want to show is the economy is growing. So before the U.S. sanction, you can see on top left corner, there is nothing on the riverbank. Uh, this is in Line Tire, one of the, the biggest industri uh, in the, the industry, the garment factories are there. So before there's nothing after US, U.S. sanction, you can start to see there is a house, the, the informal settlement forming. So now the informal settlement has encroached to the bigger area. So this area is prone to flooding, uh, all sorts of natural uh, problems. So due to the due to the housing problems, the housing shortage. So it start to show these housing uh, shortage problems. So by 2019, you can see the full settlements. So this is the current condition of that settlements that I have visited. Uh, so there there is a housing shortage that we need to look at into urgently. So coming to housing shortage, then we will look at into the microfinance sector, sector for Myanmar, because I want to highlight because there is no housing uh, microfinance that is currently available. There is few, but it's not that big. So, but let's look in the housing microfinance sector. So the MFIs are usually cover in rural area. It's not much in the urban area. As you can see, the township level has only 21%. So most is M MFI is covered in the rural area. So then, and then our microfine uh, MFI stage is very early stage. So there is no, uh, the, the problem is like maximum, we can have three year loan tenure, minimum 30% down payment we have to pay. There is a mortgage of quota bank portfolio is only 5% then lack of long-term financing. So, and then there is the biggest problem is the condo and apartment still cannot be mortgaged. So coming to the smaller MFIs, currently 68% is uh, foreign MFIs are in taking uh, the shares of the microfinance. There are quite a number of local MFI license, but then the 68% is uh, has been by before the shares by the foreign MFIs. So let's look into the housing microfinance sector. This is the one of the housing sector that we look at into uh, that currently available for, for the very low decile level for, this is meant for two and three and four decile income level. So on your left hand side, you will see on the orange color, the how he has been doing is, is borrow money from the, the microfinance from the uh, Korean HANA microfinance through the Women for the War NGO. So basically they buy the land, build a house, which is about $2,000. And then the repayment has to be uh, monthly for a period of six years. But the point I want to make here, the interest rate is 23% for the, uh, for the loan. And, and there is another emerging thing is the, the community saving groups. What we see is that these houses are kind of combined together and form a community saving group, and they can reduce down the interest rate to 10 to 15%. So they are building their own roads themselves, street lighting. So they, they, they are doing the, uh, the, the, the updating of the commu uh, their, their community with their own savings. So this is the microfinance that I want to share with you. It's a bit dense, but you can, we, I think we can share the slides uh, later on. And let's touch upon another part is the transport mobility situation in Myanmar. 
So it's surprising that we have a very, if you look at the left corner, the bus is 49% share of the, uh, of the public transport in Myanmar in 2013, which has not changed a lot. Yes, the private cars number has come up and the working also is a very high number. If you include in the middle part, the working 42%. But the, in this short presentation, I would like to focus is on the railway sector. If you see railway sector is 1%, or if it is included, well, it's 0.60%. So it's nothing uh, compared to other cities in the world. Like uh, Gavali was talking before, the, 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 the mass transit. So we need to push uh, these transport sectors from the bus to the railway sector. The reason being unable to send these uh, sectors is many reasons, but I see there's opportunity for TOD, uh, Transit Oriented Development Program, which Myanmar has not been able to grab for now, but it is the opportunity that we can do it now. So there is a Yangon Circular Railway which we need to integrate with railway and then the bus. So the, there is no, currently there's no TOD plan has been in place to connect with the bus and then the train. So this, there is a huge opportunity to include the bus connectivity and then the, 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 uh, with the train. So, and then of course the TOD bring a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, advantages such as uh, high density, mixed use, the low cost housing into it, and then the public space to the people. So, and then for the government, it also increased the land value and then it can capture the land value capture and then also bring in PPP. So these are the opportunity that uh, Myanmar government can take for, for the, uh, mixing the TOD Yangon circular railway. So by pushing that we will have we hopefully we can have more ridership on the on the train so that the, the congestion in Yangon could be decreased. And the last is because of COVID, I like to I just want to show you that Myanmar people love this is the this is the mobility during the COVID. Uh, if you see there's a medium zero percent and there is after the stay home period in April, you can see there's a park on the the park. Going to the park has not been reduced much as uh, uh, like other 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 mobility. So it seems that Myanmar people love to go to the park, and uh, the others have dropped tremendously. Uh, like workplace, a 30 39 percent decrease. 52% using uh, minus 52% decrease in public transport mobility changes. So currently you can see the second lockdown has uh, put many people in residential area uh, at home that has increased by 35%. So, so there is opportunity that we can, uh, we can do more public spaces, park. So it seems that Burmese people love going to park if, despite uh, pandemic. So uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. And to the Dumbare. Thank you very much, Mr. U Win Penlin, for highlighting the examples um, on, on the problems that, you know, um, addressing um, perhaps how to make um, Myanmar or how to create Myanmar certain cities to become mega cities. Um, I wonder if there's any lesson that. Um, lesson learned that could be shared about urbanization from the West to Myanmar or to any of the countries that our attendees um, are from? Mr. Kavali? Sorry, I, I was muted. <laughs> it was very dense, uh, uh, very dense presentation. Thank you very much. Of course, there's so many topics I would not possibly be able to cover, but what I got is I think a, a few points which I try to highlight, you know, the, the, the uh, steady growing, which compares somehow to uh, the period after the Second World War in Europe, where many uh, techniques were sort of uh, put together to try and deal with the growing in the population. I think, but I think the point today, as we are talking about sustainable planning and public spaces is, and I think was the point uh, that, <coughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Wynne made at the end is how do we think 
organically with the different systems serving the towns and how we leverage on the different systems and infrastructures uh, to actually turn this opportunity into sustainable uh, development rather than as we had in Europe, also bad examples of uh, answering to the housing problem as one single topic and uh, uh, which resolved in um, building some, um, say, um, peripheral part of towns across all Europe, which are still a problem and carries big, huge social problems. So I think thinking organically and understanding the relationship between the different infrastructures of the cities from transport to sewage, uh, but also the value and the quality of public space is something that they have the opportunity to look at it now as they are on the verge of the change, but the change is happening now and they might have the opportunity uh, uh, learning from our mistakes to readdress them uh, properly and rather than just serving what the single big problem of uh, producing enough housing for the growing population or the urbanizing or the growing urbanizing population, which is a big problem, but I think it needs to be thought as part of a bigger plan and a bigger thought um, uh, in order to build a, a better place for the people and not just uh, uh, housing for the people. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your comment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's move on to the penultimate um, panelist. She is the senior manager from the Capital Project and Infrastructure of PwC Myanmar. Um, she'll be discussing her view on under the topic shaping urban development in Yangon. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Tessa G. Morton. Thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to participate today. My name is Tessa Morton. I'm a British chartered town planner. I've been living and working in Myanmar for the last seven years, and I recently joined PwC's Capital Projects and Infrastructure team based in Yangon. So building on um, Uwin's rich presentation, I'd like to talk about shaping urban development in Yangon. So let's have a look at the snapshots for urban planning. As we know, Myanmar benefits from a regionally strategic location between the dynamic economies of China, India and Thailand. Myanmar has an estimated population growth from the current 54 million up to 70 million in 2040. And within that same time frame, urbanization is expected to increase from the current 31% up to 40%. To accommodate that growth, the number of cities with a population over 100,000 is expected to grow up to 31. This population growth brings opportunities. Since 2011, the democratic government has been embarking on economic, political and governance reform, encouraging a pro-foreign investment stance. In terms of GDP, Myanmar has seen an average growth of 7% year on year over the past seven years. And Myanmar benefits from a young population and a growing middle class with increasing income levels and enthusiasm to contribute to its country's development. So if we look to the right, Yangon regions have a significant role to play. With only 13% of the country's population, the region generates 25% of Myanmar's GDP, 85% of all exports and 60% of foreign direct investment. While these percentages are based on the pre-COVID economy, Do Aung San Suu Kyi recently announced that the economy, uh, the country has secured 98% of its foreign investment target for this year already. However, as history has shown in other developing countries, rapid economic and population growth puts pressure on governments to cater for urbanization. Infrastructure wise, there is an increasing burden on an aging and already overstretched system for services such as power, water sanitation, transportation and solid waste management. Unplanned urban sprawl continues to occur. occur. Formal, formal um, zoning and development control mechanisms are being drafted to help regulate development in a more accountable and planned way. There remains a lack of capacity in government departments and a relatively low level of formal education in urban planning. And finally, Myanmar's land title system is fragmented and the land use planning legal and regulatory framework is under development, as we shall now see. 
So here I provide some examples of the emerging regulatory framework. I won't describe all of the detail, but I've highlighted a few. So the government under Ministry of Planning and Finance and Industry has implemented a project bank. This is a web-based platform which provides a list of priority infrastructure projects which will contribute to the implementation of the Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan. The project bank has over 100 projects listed for different ministries, including upgrading of roads, construction of solar energy plants and airport refurbishments. To support development control governments, drafts of the Myanmar National Building Code have been circulating for many years. But in 2018, the Ministry of Construction announced that all construction must comply with this code. The code includes requirements of planning and architecture, structural design, lighting, water and sanitation, and building materials. The recent Myanmar Economic Recovery and Reform Plan includes strategies from maintaining monetary stability and mitigating economic shocks, and importantly, to developing more SEZs and industrial zones in strategic areas and sectors. And finally, the Urban and Regional Development Planning Law. This allows for a land use planning and zoning system to, de to be developed, and that's illustrated in the diagram to the right. Many towns and cities are now already producing town development concept plans, as shown in the pictures below. So let's focus on Yangon. Um, a lot of us will probably already know that JICA has contributed a strategic urban development plan, which provides a future vision of Yangon as an attractive international port and logistics hub. The plan recommends for phased infrastructure development and identifies new urban development areas. These areas are proposed to be connected by new or upgraded roads and railway links. The SUDP also provides development goals, such as increasing the total area of public parks, and increasing social services, such as the quality of education and healthcare. In addition to the um, regulatory system, there's also been a number of supporting initiatives which the government has worked on with different organisations. Again, I've listed a few here, but just highlighted a couple to focus on. So first of all, the World Bank's um, report, Myanmar's Urbanisation Creating Opportunities for All. This proposes a set of um, priority policy areas to encourage inclusive urbanization. Example of priorities areas are creating opportunities for informal workers and improving access to affordable housing. UN Habitat's guidelines for urban planning provide sustainable planning principles. The blue text on the right hand side shows the main principles such as providing adequate space for streets and open space and encouraging mixed land use and adequate density. So now let's take a look at some examples of public and private um, ac accessible places in Yangon. And these, I think, illustrate Professor Cavalli's point about building a common ground for users. Um, as U Win mentioned at the end of his presentation, Yangon's public parks were very well used, um, providing much needed open space and shade for social gathering and for exercise. More recent initiatives have included the introduction of linear parks across the city, which provide walking paths benches, tree cover, and outdoor exercise equipment for free. Market, markets on the streets and food stalls are also an important, important part of the urban fabric and the local economy here. However, these informal stalls can sometimes contribute to congestion on the streets by taking up the space needed for pedestrians and vehicles. Yangon Regional Government has been encouraging more structured formats recently, such as an allocated area for a night market on Strand Road. And finally, developers have also been embracing the concept of integrated mixed-use development to encourage public accessibility. The recently developed Myanmar Plaza has a very popular rooftop area, and Yoma Central under construction will provide an accessible plaza next to the refurbished heritage building. Two case studies here highlight how Yangon is making the best use of its available public spaces with new initiatives. First, Doain is an NGO established here a few years ago. So many of Yangon's back alleyways are full of rubbish, but Doain saw an opportunity to clean up these alleyways and to repurpose them into usable community spaces. Doain works closely with the government and also recognises that the community's voice needs to be at the centre of public space design. 
The second case study is a very recently announced UK government funded project called Myolanthar, which I believe roughly translates as Pleasant City Street. This project will propose an action plan for improving streets to provide green spaces, recreation areas, better parking and easier access for pedestrians and cyclists. So far, two streets have been selected as pilot projects and it is hoped that the government will be able to roll out best practice across other streets in Yangon. So finally, moving to my last slide, it's, it's easy to focus on the challenges that real estate developers can face in progressing investments in, in Myanmar, but let's, fo let's focus on the opportunities instead. For example, providing public and private space can contribute to increasing the overall quality of the urban landscape in Yangon and can provide much needed pedestrian and cycling connectivity. This also prevents an presents an opportunity of increasing footfall in local areas, which will contribute to the local economy and spending patterns. In terms of location of development, we should look at opportunities for the effective densification of areas near to major transport hubs, such as railway stations and bus stations, with TOD having already been mentioned today. Developers can work together to identify opportunities for locating complementary uses such as providing the social infrastructure required for new residential developments or providing affordable housing to support new industrial development. Keeping up to date with emerging local development plans provides the opportunity for identifying development locations which might not have previously been considered. Infrastructure connectivity should not be considered a challenge but an opportunity to make strategic investments. The drive for promoting investment in infrastructure comes from central government. And in Yangon, the local government is considering options for the privatisation of the water supply. There are proposals for new waste to energy plants. And Japan has recently provided a loan to develop a wastewater treatment plant. So to contribute to infrastructure provision, real estate developers can identify savings by providing centralised utility plant facilities, incorporating smart technologies or considering the renewable energy or water recycling on site. The focus on sustainable financing is rising. Therefore, identifying opportunities for green infrastructure and green buildings may help attract right investors and customers. And finally, let's not forget what makes urban development successful in general. Development should be located and designed with the end users in mind. Integrated mixed use developments can provide opportunities for the live, work, play lifestyle, which reduces the need to travel and improves quality of life. Developers should consider what the customers and the city's demands are in terms of use. To ensure a fully integrated mixed-use development, all groups of society should be considered and catered for. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, and I hope it's provided some interesting perspectives on opportunities for urban development within Myanmar. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Morton, for your very insightful um, presentation on the opportunities for urbanization in Yangon. Now, Mr. Kavali, I believe that you've got some comments on the presentation. Can Mr. Kavali hear me by any chance? Um, while we're waiting for Mr. Kavali, um, I believe... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Here we go. Here I am, on, sorry, it not to be working, but I, I guess it's fine. Um, I, I was saying that, to, to, thank you for this presentation as well. I, I found it very interesting, uh, uh, the capacity to discuss a regional planning, but down to very uh, small examples, such as the renovation of a little alley in Yangon. And I think that's the right approach in a way. It's always good to have a clear strategy, but we don't have we don't have to forget that people actually live big and small spaces and this is their life and uh, is really the common ground tying together this, the different communities uh, living in the same place. And uh, this is something I guess uh, Tessa also mentioned at the end. Uh, to ensure the fully integrated uh, mixed use developments for all groups of society. I think that's really it. that is really uh, the lesson I think we can learn from European towns, the capacity to integrate the all groups 
which forms a society, uh, being able not to be exclusive, but inclusive as we think of uh, the new town. Great. Thank you very much for your thoughts on that. Um, and I, I could notice that there are some of the, our um, attendees that would like to um, get a hold of the presenta presentation decks. Um, let me just inform you that all of our um, panelists, as well as the speaker, Mr. Kavali, um, we will be sending you an email um, with a link for you to download all of their presentation decks, okay, later on after this session. Okay, let's move on to the last panelist. Now, she is the Chief Research and Product Design Officer of the Planet Smart City. Her, t um, her discussion will be under the topic Places that matter, smart, affordable neighborhoods in Asia. Please give a warm welcome to Ms. Graciela Rochella. Hi, hi everybody, nice to meet you. Uh, Your Excellency, Mrs. Schiavo, Your Excellency, Mr. Galanti, Architect Cavalli, dear panelists, distinguished guests, and students, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today with you speaking at the Italian Design Day. On behalf of uh, Planet Smart City, I'd like to thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. So I'm going to share a presentation. Please let me know if you can see. Yes. Give me one second and I try to do it full screen. Can you see full screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk in a while about a special challenge that we are trying to address every day here at Plasma City, that is to shape places that matter, uh, combining the smart city concept with the one of affordability that usually are considered as opposite poles, but we will see that actually they're not. Usually smart is synonymous with the high quality infrastructure, services and equipment that evokes something that is not very accessible. On the contrary, affordable commonly identifies cheaper solutions characterized by a lower level of quality for a wide category of low income families. Today, we will see that housing must be smart and affordable. It's the mission of the public and private sector to come together to deliver this new challenging product on a global scale. That's what cities like Yangon, Mandalay, Bangkok are expecting and actually what we think they deserve. No matter whether they are capable of delivering public policies that can help solve the affordable housing problem. We, as a private uh, sector um, stakeholder, we can help solve this. So let's begin and let's focus on the first term of, the, um, of this binomial. So what is a smart city? What is a smart neighborhood? Usually, uh, as far as I know, uh, as always was announced almost 30 years ago, it's just nowadays that the smart city concept and the smart neighborhood concept uh, have been growing and assuming tangible content. So as far as I know, the first time that I, I heard about the smart city concept, it was uh, used uh, as a subtitle of this book called The Technopolis Phenomenon. It was 1992, and it was used together with the fast systems and global networks. It was really a long time ago. After that, more than 3,000 papers have been written on this concept. And you can see here from this curve that um, the theoretical field is very, very dense. But what if, uh, what, what we can say out of the theoretical field? How many real smart city projects can you mention? So to try to reply to this uh, question, we at Plan Smart City, we have developed this uh, smart project map. It's a, it's a research tool that we use to scout uh, all around the world, key smart city projects. So here you can see um, more than 180 projects, and you can see um, in blue what we call the smart city projects by private developers, like 
for instance, uh, Mazdar City in the United Arab Emirates, Toronto Riverside by the Cyber Labs, uh, and many others. In red, on the contrary, you can see the smart projects carried out by the chief innovative uh, officers of various municipalities, like uh, New York City, Amsterdam, Tel Aviv, Barcelona, and uh, eventually in green, you see some very uh, few of them, but the, they are our project, the project that we are, got, we, are um, we are developing right now as Planet Man City. Here, uh, five projects uh, are located in Thailand and four in Myanmar. So we found while we were developing all of these uh, scouting and research that uh, uh, we needed a new taxonomy to define the smart city concept, not just based on the technocratic paradigm, but a, a more comprehensive and um, holistic one. So we found that um, an integrated approach is needed, and we try to adopt a transversal but scientific approach, thus defining four key areas in which we collected smart solutions. They are social innovation, planning and architecture, technological systems, and environment. So we built this taxonomy together with the uh, ARUP, the engineering firm, and we went out with uh, more than 20 areas. And right now we collect on our catalog more than 200 solutions. But now let's focus a little bit on the affordability. Uh, so we chart the dimensions of the problem and what is considered uh, to be affordable. Let's start from this last uh, um, topic and uh, from the definition. So generally speaking, uh, what is considered to be uh, affordable worldwide is something that is not more expensive than 30 to 40% of a household income. Instead, going to the, the, the dimension, it's considered that more than 23 million um, housing units are built every year worldwide. Out of these, 11 million are devoted to affordable housing. So it's more than 48%. But what we generally see is that 90% of the response to this demand is actually of this quality. So it's something that we see is lacking of urban planning. There is poor quality of infrastructure. There is no innovation. No way this kind of project can even think about beauty, one of the words that we are referring today as the, one of the topics of the Italian design grade. We think that people deserve more. And so uh, this is what we try to, to bring together. I mean, to, within the framework of affordable housing as an urgent need, uh, we know that more than 440 million globally um, of, of uh, people will need, sorry, of uh, households uh, will be in need of housing. So according to UN Habitat, more than 1.6 billion people will be struggling with inadequate, unsecure, and largely overcrowded housing. There are lots of studies, even in this field, and it is not this map is showing five of the high-ranked uh, countries uh, with the most high deficit uh, or housing shortage. And they are, in order actually, they are China, India, Russia, Brazil, and Nigeria all together. And here you can see one of the programs of the government that um, have been uh, uh, programmed in different countries. Like this one is the program from Brazil. It's called Minha Casa Minha Vida. And it's a program that is providing houses, but it's also providing a regulatory framework for the private sector to act uh, and to help solving this problem. So I was anticipating, what is the, what is the solution then? How we can uh, design and build, and build smart and affordable neighborhoods all together? Um, as urban innovation and technological solutions continue to grow rapidly, city governments are increasingly under pressure to manage interests of the private sector and concerns of citizens, while also identifying relevant and cost-effective solutions. To realize the vision behind a smart, sustainable neighborhood, 
cities need to address two key issues. First, how to adopt public policies that encourage the creation of smart urban environments. And second, how to collaborate with private sector partners in order to implement effective smart solutions on the ground. As um, urban innovation is, uh, is, is growing, we, we need to transform the way affordable housing is delivered worldwide. And of course, we have to work into the framework of the sustainable development goal. It is clear uh, that we need to transform this, the affordable housing because also the pool between commercialization and security and privacy of data is one of these challenges. And another pressing demand faced by cities is the ability to provide affordable housing to all, which is closely tied to the goals, as I was mentioned before. Now, let me give you uh, some examples on how we can operate. The following slides are showing three projects. This one is Linnezzo, by Investire SGR, which is an Italian social housing developer. And it's a project that won the first prize at a, the international competition called Reinventing Cities last year. Uh, it was developed uh, in a former railway area. And uh, as you can see, there is a quality of the public spaces that is deeply integrated into the fabric of the built environment. It's for 400 million housing units, all of them devoted to social housing, so it's an affordable housing program. And uh, there will be also 300 new beds for students because it's near uh, an area which is full of, uh, of course, university spots uh, here in Milano. Uh, this project will host more than 69 innovative solutions, like such as the sustainable water management, community for composting, um, solutions, pedestrian paths, neighborhood, uh, uh, and app for, uh, for uh, the neighborhood. This one, second one, is called Laguna Smart City, and this has been developed by Plan Smart City in uh, Ceará State, which is in the northeast of Brazil. It's very big because it's more than 330 hectares of land, and we, we lost more than uh, uh, um, 25,000 inhabitants by 2022. It is right now under um, construction. What I would like to highlight here is the presence of these public spaces uh, within the, the urban planning uh, um, and within the urban design. So we built an innovation hub that basically is a community center into which people can engage and do uh, activities like courses, uh, uh, they can borrow um, objects from the library of things, they can borrow books from the book crossing activities and so on. Then there are sports facilities all around the cities. And of course, there are also uh, open outdoor area for uh, uh, gym, uh, like this one that is equipped with what we call the smart gym equipment. So, uh, that are brand new uh, equipment so with which while you do exercise you can produce energy with which you can uh, recharge your uh, uh, smartphone or your devices so that's how we interpret uh, the, the the smart for housing concept last but not least uh, this is life republic this is supposed to be the first smart affordable housing project in asia we're working here together with Coltepati limited which is a, an indian developers and this is also currently under uh, construction, partially has been already built, totally will host more than 20,000 people, but this new uh, district within that Republic is going to host 2,000 uh, uh, housing units and it will host more than 50 innovative solutions. So with these three examples, I hope that um, I've offered to you a concrete example of how public and private space can help shape places that matter. Because ultimately, as um, Maimouna Mont Sharif uh, has uh, recently said, the private sector should invest in sustainable development projects, deploying innovative ideas for affordable housing, infrastructure, and clean technologies. And I have took this opportunity of this um, 
very recent report from the UN Habitat that has been published uh, last week uh, to conclude my speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very insightful uh, presentation. Now, um, I think we've got some comments or some highlights that uh, Mr. Cavalli would like to add to your presentation. Yes, thank you. <coughs> uh, well, it's uh, again, this is <coughs> uh, where I try to start with, with my presentation, understanding the relationship between technology and uh, uh, space. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Graziella's presentation really was very uh, thoughtful about this matter. And it is something we as architects have to have in mind and understand uh, the different times and the different developments and uh, the, the different pace, uh, the, the physical environment and the digital environment uh, 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 are with. So this is really the mo most complex relationship I think we have to deal with in the future. Uh, but trying to leverage on the opportunities the new technologies give us, but keeping in mind the idea that when we build a piece of town, it will stay for centuries. So this is really the balance we have to find and understand uh, uh, what resilience really mean as we are thinking and building the physical environment, uh, keeping in mind the opportunities that technologies offer us. Thank you very much once again to our speaker, Ms. Um, Graciela Roxella and Mr. Cavalli. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have mentioned earlier um, this, um, throughout this session that you can drop your question at the Q&A box um, and our speaker will be selecting the question and answer them. So I think we've got a couple of questions if the time permits us. Let's start with the first question. The question being how would it be possible to develop such similar development um, without the need of the government finance um, as countries such as Myanmar do not have necessary such means. Mr. Kavali, would you like to address that? Yeah, I, I think uh, it would be great to actually involve the different panelists. And I suppose that maybe Graziella may help us address this, uh, uh, possibly together with uh, uh, Tessa Morton, just to have a, a double a view on the matter from uh, Europe and from Southeast Asia. So I kindly ask Gertzella and Tessa to try and articulate on the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. Um, according to Plan Smart City, it's not necessary that the government is investing directly their money into this kind of program. It's what we find is very useful and what lets us operate in those countries is the presence of a regulatory framework. So we just need as a private sector operator that the government sets up parameters, sets up, I mean, requirements for the houses, quality requirements, and requirements for the families to get access to the credit. So this is crucial. If the families don't get access to uh, the credit, of course, we cannot build because um, in our model, we, we come, we buy the land, we develop projects uh, and we ask permission, of course, then we build and then we sell. So in this framework, uh, how we work in Brazil is um, what we would like to operate also in the other countries. The, the, the presence of the Minha Casa Minha Vida program uh, is uh, crucial. So I think and I hope uh, we will explore in the next month uh, what Thailand and Myanmar are doing because uh, it's just sufficient to set up parameters and then the private sector will come because it's so huge the demand as Mr. Sorry for the pronunciation, uh, Mr. Hu Wing Teng Lin has enlightened and I, I really would like to have your presentation. There is such a need in, um, of affordable housing and also as uh, Mrs. Tess Morton has enlightened. The, 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 those countries are growing dramatically and so there is a need we, we there is a huge market <laughs> it's also an opportunity it's not just a need i will stop thank you Tessa. Tessa, you are muted 
Ms. Morton, can you unmute, please? Any thoughts on that? Okay, well, while we're well, maybe waiting... Maybe we can ask if, if Tessa Morton's not available. Maybe we can ask maybe uh, Win Tain Lin uh, to maybe articulate on this question as well. I, well, for me, I see like Myanmar government could use uh, land value capture mechanisms. Of course, there are rays of land value capture mechanisms, such as uh, property tax, uh, transaction sales income, and then raising the land value. Of course, these are the rays, um, but uh, for Myanmar, we still need to fix like property tax, which is so super low. You know, there is a saying, it's a cup of tea cost only for six months or property tax that we pay in Myanmar. So these are the property tax that we can increase. But of course, the transaction sales that we can, uh, transaction sales because of the land value has come up because of all these developments and the government can benefit from the tax of transaction sales. So these are the things we could do, but of course, uh, they are there are fundamental things that we need to fix. Of course, it's not uh, not 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 in one day. Yeah, so th there will be a few years that we need to implement all these stuff. But I, I would like to stop there. Thank you. I just had one little line. Uh, the uh, the the square of city life we've shown and the park of city life was actually financed by the private developer under uh, the general framework, which uh, Graciela and uh, uh, and Mr. Hugh was talking about. So I think really it's about defining the uh, the general policies and framework and then uh, developers eventually understand the value of public spaces, although they might not directly generate revenues, but they build places where people want to go, which is the real value. The real value is really football, if you want to talk about numbers or is the quality of spaces where people want to go and this will bring bad value to the buildings eventually so this is something that is now understood across uh, the European culture and uh, and of course there's been a long work in setting the policies and the, the kind of the planning frameworks for that but it is eventually a win-win opportunity for both the private and the public sector. I believe that answers the question very well. So let's move on to the second selected question from Min Chan Mon. Um, her question was, can some organizations provide technical assistance, for example, design and architect to, re to the restoration of those old heritage buildings? Who would who would do you think would be most suitable to answer this question, Mr. Cavalli? Uh, I, I might try and answer that. So I, I'm uh, not just directly suggesting an organisation, but of course it's more of a common culture which every country needs to grow. Uh, it, every country understands its heritage better than any other one. It's just a matter of uh, understanding the value of it and uh, um, getting trained on how to look at heritage. And when I say heritage, and I made the example of Bologna, it's not just about buildings and the opportunities to turn them into different news, which is, of course, a challenge. But understanding that the heritage of a town is not just a single building, but is the quality of the overall space, the buildings, open spaces and infrastructure built across uh, time. This, I think, is the main lesson we've learned, particularly in Italy, uh, after the, say, after the 60s. And so not just looking at the single uh, buildings, but looking at part of towns as an opportunity uh, uh, to leverage upon and try and understand how ancient infrastructures and ancient structures uh, can actually accommodate uh, contemporary users. And technology is today far more advanced and will help us a lot in doing that. Then on, on the specific question, who to talk to, I think, I, I guess uh, there's an opportunity with the uh, Italian embassies in two countries, which 
could probably be, and the and of course the Institute of Trade, which could possibly be a good way to start discussing the matter and organizing proper meetings with the, the relevant people and organization back in Italy. Okay, thank you very much. A great pointer there for um, Min Chan Moon to discuss further possibility. Okay, the last question, ladies and gentlemen, um, came from C2 Min. Um, her question is changing building design into modern, um, the modern building. Is it a good idea? If it is, why? If it's not, why? Um, let's. Um, she actually got a lot of um, other questions, but I think perhaps uh, Mr. Cavalli would like to. I can see there's somewhere. about 26 different questions, uh, very articulated. Uh, on this one, though, I'd like to ask Marie Louise maybe uh, to tell us about having uh, a European background, but now being professor in Thailand. I think and being an architect, I think uh, she could be the right voice to answer this question. Ms. Hao? Yes. Thank you. I, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, I think this is actually the bottom line of resilience is uh, how much uh, building, is, let's say, building typologies are able to adapt over time, whether it's informal adaptation or whether it's planned for some authority or institution. Actually, one of the projects I showed in the presentation was this idea of kind of public use zones, designated zones in the city for public use. And as part of that, the student explored the transformation of the old customs house, a kind of alternative transformation into a sort of publicly accessible building. And I think this is it's quite interesting to, I guess, consider when we go through these sequences of transformation from maybe industrial use to, let's say, inhabitation, as in the case of the loft typology, or when we think about now the change of the work-life relationship from office spaces and how we can transform them yet again into another use value, how, how this, I guess, how we build upon this existing space, how we can integrate the local population into this um, transformation process. I think not transforming is not the answer. I think we just have to understand who we involve in the process and um, how we can do it in a way that it, um, yeah, that it builds on an existing, let's say, yeah, architectural method. Thank you very I, much. I would totally, would totally agree with Marie Louise. And actually, uh, resilience is really the word uh, for what it means. Uh, and uh, I have to say that in our experience, uh, funnily enough, it's been easier to work on what is usually understood as being a heritage building than actually working on a modern building to be transformed. Uh, modern buildings tend to be designed for a specific scope, whereas what we call historical buildings were more generic in a way. And being generic now results into being far more flexible than what we would expect. So I wouldn't be really uh, worried by uh, reusing uh, historical buildings. I think the very issue is how do you actually deal with modern architecture? When I say modern architecture, I mean architecture of the 20th century, mainly, and particularly from the first six years of the 20th century. Um, this is more of a challenge, believe it or not, but I wouldn't be worried about heritage, uh, heritage buildings or historical buildings. Uh, they tend uh, they tend to be far more resilient that they may appear at the first glance. Thank you very much for your final thought on the question from um, our last question from the attendees. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, let's say thank you to all of our speakers, um, Mr. Cavalli, as well as um, all of the panelists. Um, and we hope that we will be um, joined. Well, we will be joined by all of you um, in the near future. Now, before we go, um, I like to introduce or actually invite 
the person behind this wonderful event of the Italian Design Day in Thailand and Myanmar 2020. Please give a warm welcome to the Trade Commissioner of the Italian Trade Agency Bangkok office to greet all of us, Mr. Giuseppe Lamacchia. Dear all participants to our webinar today, I would like to thank all of you for joining the conference organized to celebrate the Italian Design Day 2020 for Thailand and Myanmar. I would like to thank in particular for sharing their expertise with us, the Ambassador of Italy to Myanmar, Her Excellency Alessandra Schiavo, the Ambassador of Italy to Thailand, His Excellency Lorenzo Galanti, our panelists coordinated by architect, architect Leonardo Cavalli. The great number of participants to the webinar confirms the interest for the topic and for the Italian design in general in both countries, Thailand and Myanmar. Your presence shows a strong commitment to work together. Today, we have mainly discussed about urban design. I would like also highlight that the Italian design is globally well known in many sectors, such as fashion, furniture, exterior and interior design, automotive industry, and so on. My, my idea is to create together a climate of can-do can attitude towards our enchanting world of Italian design. The Italian Trade Agency Bangkok office, in collaboration with the Italian embassies in Thailand and Myanmar, remains at your disposal for any information and assistance you need. We will be happy to develop further activities as a follow-up of the today webinar, aiming to enforce the, the collaboration and the business between Thai, Burmese, and Italian architects, and as well as their companies and organizations. Once again, I would like to thank all participants, and also let me thank the interpreters, OneWork and ITA staff, the technicians and the working team for making today's virtual event possible. Thank you and see you again soon. Thank you very much, Mr. Giuseppe Lamacchia, the Trade Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the virtual event of the Italian Design Day, Thailand and Myanmar 2020. Before we go, I'd like to um, address that all of the presentation decks of our speakers today will be sent to your email by today. So only for those registered attendees. Now, before we go, I'd like to express our gratitude to our organizer, the Italian Embassy in Thailand, the Italian Embassy in Myanmar, the Italian Trade Agency, Bangkok Office, all five panelists, as well as our um, guest speaker, Ms. Honorable Guest Speaker, Mr. Um, Leonardo Cavalli and the interpreters, all four of them. But most importantly, I'd like to thank all of the 190 attendees that have stayed with us throughout this session um, for joining us today. And we hope that you will enjoy the rest of your um, day in Europe or nighttime in Asia. And we hope that you will be joining us in our next session, which we will be um, communicating to you very soon. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. So I think happy.